There you have it, the big story from the past weekend, the Easter weekend, match day 30. It's a warm welcome once again to another episode of Serie A Chronicles. This is Patrick Kendrick alongside Mina Razuki and Nikki Bandini as ever and producer Simon. And what a weekend it was on Easter. Before we get into all of the Serie A action and that winning goal from Adam Marusic, which gave Igor Tudor uh, a maximum point on his first game in charge... How were your respective Easter weekends and how much chocolate did you eat, roughly? A disgusting amount. Nice. A genuinely disgusting amount of chocolate. I've, so you I've didn't heed so that warning not to eat a whole Easter egg in one <laughs> sitting that I saw doing the rounds? The problem is, right, so there's, there's a chocolate shop in Brighton that does um, a really good like salted caramel egg. So I buy myself that every year. It's an expensive egg because it's an expensive chocolate shop. I buy myself that every year. So I already had that. And then I'd bought myself some other Easter chocolate that I saw, some uh, Kinder Bueno like mini eggs. So I'd already got those. Then my family <laughs> showed up for Easter and I was given unexpectedly um, some, my mum was giving me some like hot honey Easter bunnies I haven't eaten yet. And my nieces brought me a lint chocolate egg as well. So I'm suddenly just like drowning in chocolate, um, which um, I'm surprisingly uh, good at putting away when I want to. So yeah, I'm eating way too much chocolate, thanks. But I haven't got actually what I really love at Easter to my, not really to my shame. I'm I'm very much middle-aged these days, but my, my favorite thing at Easter, which I didn't get this year, is still the big Italian Kinder Maxi eggs. They always make me happy and think of being a kid. But we've come with a surprise as well. Exactly. Not just the Kinder ones. That's what they were saying to me this weekend. They're saying the difference between Italian Easter eggs and English Easter eggs is you always get a little gift inside the Italian eggs. But uh, Mina, how is your chocolate count? We are not middle aged. Like you have to take that back. Like, you know, I mean, I don't know what on earth. Like, like I'm sorry, but what? Like, I'm just no. All right. We're not middle aged. No. I take it no. back. <laughs> no, Nikki, take it back, okay? Like, that was a horrible way. In our 30s, <laughs> like, in our 30s, like... that's the fact. There you go, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> just, just going off average life expectancies and sort of thinking, I'm oh, sort God, of this is a ha- this is a happy <laughs> conversation, isn't it? Dear, <laughs> isn't it? It is, it is, it is comfortably moving up to the 90s, it. which means we're quite a well away, okay? <laughs> so let's not get there. And we took our COVID vaccines <laughs> for whatever it is, and I'm not accepting this crap. Um... <laughs> You might think I'm a witch, but I hate the taste of sugar, um, unless it's in a Coca-Cola uh, can. Um, so I don't, I hate chocolate. <laughs> I know it's crazy. I hate chocolate. I hate ice cream. So I'm a witch. You know, actually, funny story. <laughs> on my on my like first trip with my boyfriend, we went to the Amalfi Coast and he had done this nice. whole amazing trip for us. Because my favorite movie growing up was something called Only You with Robert Downey Jr. and Marissa Tomei. And they retrace and we retraced all the steps. And in one of them, we go and get and he gets me this ice cream. Yeah. And he's like, you know, he's so like enthralled by it because he's obsessed with ice cream. And I'm so embarrassed to be like, I don't like it because you had taken me to this particular shop that he had researched so much. And you know, and I'm sort of eating it and then chucking it behind me. You can't see that I'm not eating the ice cream. And you just see this puddle of like chocolate hazelnut ice cream on the floor that I'm like, crap, I'm now littering. <laughs> it was like a disaster. But yes, yeah, so this but to is that how much extent, I have to you don't, the You really don't like it. It's not just that you wouldn't go out of your way to have one. You actually don't like the taste of it. No, I don't. I that don't is, like the taste of it at that all. Is amazing. I don't like anything really sweet. Like mm. people walk into these bakeries and see like, you know, a pan of chocolat or, or see like anything in like their mouth waters or like pastries or cakes. It genuinely makes me feel sick. Like it's a really bizarre thing. So, um, but it's something I don't like to tell because people just think I'm just like a witch or something, which maybe I am. I don't know. I'm not but... sure that's what makes a witch. <laughs> no, <it's all> witch. <laughs> and surely that's quite, that's probably got some benefits as well in terms of your teeth and your waistline and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, if I, I think we'd all like to, well, you know, I love chocolate, but there we go. So uh, I've got two possible segues from what you both said there. One was um, Nikki saying that she's very good at putting away chocolate, which is unlike Juventus mm-hmm. at scoring goals. And the other possible <laughs> one was, Mina talking about life expectancy and thinking about whether Max Allegri does have long to live on the Juventus bench. So I think we'll start, we'll okay, start with, the, God, you see my Juventus? with the latter. Yeah, of oh, course, absolutely. Yeah. I'm talking very metaphorically as to his long-term 
career credentials in Turin. You know, I'm not, not ruling him out from mm-hmm. taking another, another job elsewhere. But this has been an ongoing theme now. Mina, we'll start with you because it's Juventus related. And feels like a bit of a disservice to Lazio to start to lead with Juventus. But I still think Juventus, again, losing seven points in the last nine matches is the big story here. And where do you stand now? I know you are an Allegri acolyte. I know you defend him to the hilt. I'm fond of of what he's achieved in his career as well. But I saw a very interesting statistic earlier on today, which was talking about how Simon Inzaghi's taken X number of matches to get his 100 wins. And the only person that did it faster, I think, was, was Allegri. We have this huge difference, don't we, between what he achieved in his first spell where he has so much credit, but he seems to be rapidly running out of credit now. And it, it feels like, whereas... Before, it was the online Juventus fans who were leading the Allegri out chance. Now it seems to be creeping in as well to some of the match-going supporters. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, a lot of the match-going supporters have been against him too. I think it was the ultras, really, that are pro-Allegri. Um, I I feel like the rest of people, I think a good now 80% of people want Allegri out, in all honesty. I think that we're left with the ultras and potentially just me, um, who are still flying the flag. It is an interesting thing because... I once did this podcast and talked about Conte being, uh, he should be sacked after losing for Inter in the Champions League. And I think back about that all the time and I think that was such a ridiculous take. Um, and I don't know, ever since then, I've I've completely changed my mind about sacking coaches and think I'm always keen on keeping them as long as possible on the bench until I see improvement. So I have defended Pioli, I defend Allegri, I will defend Inzaghi when, in the, when he came after Conte and people were unhappy with the direction he was taking the team in and felt that they had dropped menta- mentality-wise. With Allegri, though, I have sort of reached the end of my tether, not because I think he's making a mistake, um, but I do think that there's a genuine disconnect at the team right now. It's really bizarre because I wrote this. It, it, I had to, I was working on Saturday night to cover Ch- Chelsea Burnley. So I was covering the Premier League um, for, uh, for TRT. And I watched the last minute goal. And I don't know what happened. Honestly, I don't know what happened. I just burst into tears. And I oh, do wow. not remember the last time I felt so much emotion watching my club. I think it's because I've been so used to them never really being this awful, if that makes No, you know what it is? It's the first time that I saw this team and didn't see the hope anymore. Didn't see that potentially it's going to change. Or didn't see like, I'm like, this is, it keeps getting worse. This is year on year end. And I and the one person I did trust was bringing Max Allegri might manage to do something special. And I'm now realizing that maybe this, like if he can't get through to this team at this point, like I don't know where to go. And I don't blame this on him. I just, I still think he's a terrific coach. I don't care. You can come for me as much as you like. This is For people who sit there and say that he's a, a dinosaur and all this stuff, like the guy was in competition to, to challenging Inter for the half of the season with the world's most mediocre Juventus side. So to say that I think is so far and to say that the players are regressing when you're seeing Weston McKenney put on performances that he was never capable of putting on last season, who was demoted with the likes of Leeds, when you're seeing Andrea, Camb- uh, um, Andrea Cambiasso being able to be so tactically intelligent and play different roles and be form- forming part of Luciano Spalletti's team, there are clear players who have made a step forward under Allegri. Yes, there are others who aren't shining and the team has massive there's a massive disconnect because I just feel like Allegri is used to like Ancelotti likes experienced players is more of a man manager who tries to extract potential of individuals perhaps not a tactician in the way that has rehearsed patterns of play and that is exactly what youngsters need youngsters can't be left to their own devices to to sort of figure it out which is a lot of the time of what Allegri likes to do and that why that's why it works with Ronaldo because Ronaldo doesn't teach you not Ronaldo I mean I'm saying any sort of you know like Sammy Kadira, he doesn't need you to tell him what to do. He knows what to do. He just wants the freedom to do it. And that's what Allegri does so well, is that he manages the, the egos. He manages the experience. But actually having rehearsed patterns of play is exactly what kids need. And in a team that is full of kids and has lost a lot of importance in midfield from Fagioli to Pogba, obviously, to now then, you know, having not Vlaovic up front, no Milik up front, you know, putting in Yildiz or Chiesa or Moise Keen. I mean, they're not exactly like, barring Chiesa, the others are not exactly they're either young or haven't made a huge splash or have the experience necessary. I think that it's so much to just keep saying Allegri out as if some guy is going to come in and Juventus are all of a sudden going to be like the next Inter. 
that's what worries me is that people are like, look at Roma, look at De Rossi. This is all it takes. You just need to. And it's no, that's not all it takes because we've had different coaches and it's been a disaster. It is a step. It, look, we are taking steps forward because Juntili is a great sporting director and hopefully it will change. And there, this is a step forward from last season. But this is there isn't a magic potion. This squad needs vast changes in it. The squad is not good enough for Juventus or what the expectations are from the fans. And when people sit there and say that, you know, Allegri out and this is what the problem is. I don't know. Maybe Allegri needs to be out. And, I, and I'm worried now that we won't hit top four. And I think that this, the team's no longer responding to him. There needs to be a shock in the system. But there's a Coppa Italia match tonight. So let's see. Nikki, lots to unpack there. Um, Mina referenced the fact that Juventus started with a 4-3-3, which was a departure from what we've seen with Allegri. What did you make of Cambiaso playing at right wing? De Chilio played for the first time in, in, in 10 months. And, and secondly, if we look at it now, Juventus are only two ahead of Bologna, seven ahead of Roma, and nine ahead of Atalanta, albeit the latter have a game in hand. Do you see over the next eight matches them being overhauled by a couple of those teams and, and possibly not even finishing in the top five? It's the first time, this is the first week when I've looked at it and gone, this is possible actually. Like this is no longer completely unthinkable. I, I don't think it will happen, but they have won one game out of the last nine. And mm. that win was against Frosinone in the 94th minute. So it's not even like that win was a good win. It's, it's, it's really been bad for a long time. And, and you're asking me about the specifics of this game, about Dishilio, about Cambia. So honestly, Patrick, I thought this was a dreadful game of football to watch. It was not an enjoyable spectacle. <laughs> you didn't like um, the, the but, way Lazio went about their business? I, I thought they Lazio, were quite bold. Lazio, Lazio mm. certainly had more about them. I thought Iga Tudor, like, for a first game in charge, you could look at it and think that there's there's more to to to, to feel promising about. I think they deserve to win 100%. Um, obviously, it's a, a lovely ball from Guendouzi as well for the goal. Um, I perhaps will accept that my whole feeling about this game is probably wrapped up in my feeling about I watched a lot of football without goals in this weekend my goodness I mean the Arsenal City game was was definitely worse but um that it felt like I was watching uh screens for a very very long time without <laughs> balls going near goals and and this game was certainly part of that picture for me um I I I don't I, I agree with the substance of what Mina just said. I don't I don't think Allegri can fix this anymore. I don't think that has to mean it's all Allegri's fault. I think we can say that recruitment hasn't been good enough. We can say that there's problems that perhaps couldn't have been foreseen, like what's happened with Pogba. Um, there's problems at, at board level. Clearly, the whole thing has, has come apart and, and needs to be rebuilt. And, and those are difficult things that take more than a minute to fix. But to me, Allegri, um, without wanting to always bring it back to my my Arsenal fandom, but it just it really feels like the end of us in Wenger, where you can feel positively towards the person, you can feel sad about the end of something, but he's just not the person who's going to fix it anymore. And it can also be true that maybe the next person won't fix it either, because Unai Emery is a good manager and he came into Arsenal and he wasn't going to be able to fix it right away because because it's not a one job, one person straight away job to fix. And and frankly, in in that case, I think even then you could easily have, have walked away from Mikel Arteta before he has managed to fix it. And I think now you can say a corner's clearly been turned. But in that case, again, if we want to draw those parallels, guess what? Arsenal also spent a heap of money. So are you eventually prepared to do that as they go for a rebuild here? Are they prepared to 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 stick with someone and to give them the backing they need and to, and to put that time into someone? Because I think that's probably what you have to do to fix a situation like this. And and you can get stuck in that mire to do a different comparison, but still within England, Manchester look at United. Manchester United and, and all this time after Sir Alex Ferguson still not having found the answer that, that's the right one. So it's, I think, I think Juventus are, I think the first step is almost that Juventus need to acknowledge the extent of the problem because it's, on the one hand, it's it's a luxury problem because I think the Juventus in the current state still should be expecting to finish in the Champions League spaces every season. They would have done every season if it wasn't for the fact that last year they had the points penalty, right? They still would have finished third last season, which is not what you're aiming for. But the financial side of it, what that means, that should be a, a bare minimum, obviously. Um, but I do think that to become something new, to refresh, to start becoming a title challenger again, it has to be a serious refresh. It has to be more than piecemeal. And, and I think that's the acknowledgement that needs to be made at Juventus. But ironically, I think that, go ahead, Mina. I was going to say, I, I just think that 
Juventus have to figure out who they are. And I don't think that's clear at the moment. And by, by that, I mean, there are two, two ways of being a football club. You can be a club that builds a philosophy and ensures that that philosophy is indoctrinated into your squad from an early age and you have a pattern of play. You have an established style of going for, you know, you're, you're the likes of Barcelona, for example, or Brighton or whatever it is, or, or Arsenal now, or, or you, you're a team that is a pragmatic, a pragmatic team which is a little bit of what Chelsea are they can chop and change they can bring in whoever the players they like but the whole point is to just extract the potential of players and they went for for coaches that were capable of doing that at the time which is why they had so much success despite literally almost changing coaches every two years at the time and that was because it was a very well-run club at the very top they de- they depended so much on Marina and, and Abramovich and the way that this club was run and they spent a lot of money doing it and Juventus have always leaned towards that direction, which is, you know, we buy the best players. A little bit of what Marotta is doing at, at, at Inter, we buy the best players and then it's up to you to try to figure out the best way. But now it just seems like it's, Juntili is a man who is is created for a philosophy. He is a man who knows how to build with a philosophy, who needs to be aligned um, with everyone on board to to build the specific strategy going forward. And And he's not a pragmatist. He's not a practical sporting director who's going to go for a bargain, you know? And so if... If you choose him, then you must continue to go through that route. And if you choose Allegri, then you must also choose to continue going down that route. And I think there's just a clash of ideologies all over the place, which makes it very hard to understand who Juventus are and who they want to be. So do you want to be a team that builds truly with youngsters? Then you have to understand Allegri is not your guy. And then you stick with Juntili and bring someone else in. And it can't be Zidane because Zidane is a pragmatist. But if you do decide that you want to go for a pragmatic approach, then Juntili wasn't the guy that you should have gone for. So this is this is where I'm like, I don't know who Juventus are. And there seems to be a huge disconnect at the top level. I think, I think history- they have such good foundations to build on. Sorry, Patrick, we should probably you move on. You're trying as a host to keep us moving. But like the, the next gen project is, is at this point, I would say a proven success. There is talented footballers coming out of that next gen project who are contributing to your team and also contributing to other teams in Serie A this season. Mm-hmm. So you, you have a, a base to build on. Um, but it, it needs to be more They coherent. don't play a style of play. They don't have a unique philosophy. They are all just really good players. Again, it's a pragmatic yeah. approach. We're going to collect the best individuals who play great sets that, or or have different different skills. There isn't an ideology. Like you understand when you've got a Barcelona kid in your team. You understand when you have a, a Dortmund kid. In, you, know, you understand that. You don't have that with Juve. Juve is, is almost like um, La Castilla for Real Madrid. It's just a collection of really good players. But there again, there's no philosophy. So th- who are you? And I just need them to decide on that. Personally, I think and Juventus you are have, go... have wasted five years, to be honest. I think once Allegri yes, goes have. the first time That's around. That's what I was upset about. You have Sarri for a year and you dispense with him. You bring in Pirlo as well, a slightly rushed appointment. You give him a season as well, despite him winning trophies. And then you've had three years with Allegri where... You've not really gone anywhere mm-hmm. at all. I think they'd have been better off giving either Sarri three years or, dare I say, Pirlo two or three years and, and letting them manage yes. that transition. Mm-hmm. And then you might be further along. But obviously, we can't go back in time. I think history tells us that Juventus probably won't appoint a foreign coach, even though Zidane did play for the club. And obviously, he speaks the language. I think typically Juventus go with go with Italian head coaches. And I guess technically, Thiago Motta, Thiago Motta is Italian having played for the Italian mm-hmm. national team, albeit being Brazilian-born. Um, Oriundo. Is he, is it, absolutely, Oriundo, a foreign-born player. Is he the best man mm-hmm. at this moment in time to take Juventus forward? But is there not an argument to say, if he does get Bologna into the Champions League places, would he not want to be the man to take charge of that first Champions League campaign? You almost feel, it feels annoying, doesn't it? I've built this. Why should I hand yeah. it over to someone else to take? It's it's a fascinating situation in that Bologna, who have, I mean, at the, at the start of February, there was 20 points between these teams, right? 20 points, that's barely over um, two months ago because we're recording on the 2nd of April. Um, the um, um, 20 points, the gap's now two points. And it's, it's looking very plausible now that Bologna could finish above Juventus, which is crazy. Um, I think it would be sort of romantically tragic for him not to take another season at Bologna and see where he can take it but if I was um in Juventus's shoes and there was a report Sport Italia had a quite confident report last night saying um oh uh, the numbers are already agreed years and and con- years and and salary um I, I'm taking that with a pinch of salt but I, I do think the reality is when we talk about these things um 
I think maybe fans don't always see it quite how it happens, which I think agents have conversations with directors all the time and there may well be outlines of, of what could be a deal in place. But that doesn't mean that Mott has made his mind about what he's going to do yet. That's a conversation between an agent and a director about some outlines. Um, but the... Um, but if you're if you're Juventus, do I think it could be a good appointment? I, I do. And the reason I think it could be a good appointment actually is I think there's lots I like about Motta's football. I think he plays a, a modern kind of football. They have this sort of um quite clear identity. They play in a fluid way, which I think is is something that if you're trying to move on and 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 move with the times, I think he's the right manager to do that. But I think more than that, having just said what I did about the next gen project and about the young players there, I think when I look at this Bologna team, what I see is just a whole bunch of players where I can say very clearly that player has improved. Mm. Ricardo Rossolini in two seasons under Motta has scored double figures both seasons and now is is knocking on the door of the Italy team. Carla Fiori, who was not good enough to break into Mourinho's first team at Roma. Okay, he went and had a year at Basel. He's come into that team now. He's been switched from a left back into a centre back and now he's starting and again, knocking on the door of the Italian national team. Lewis Ferguson, Maybe some people thought he had some promise when he showed up there, but he wasn't playing at the level he is he is now. I think all through that team, you look at players and go, well, that player's got better. And so when I look at Marta and I think, well, if your idea is let's get all these next gen kids in and let's actually see what we have here, I think I think he's a good choice for that. I think he's someone who I believe would would take them on and make them and make them better. Is it the job that I think he should want? Well, I think that probably comes down to frank conversations about what Juventus can and can't offer. Bologna have put together something magical this season, but realistically, I think someone's going to sign Zerks, uh, Zerks this summer. It, you can't say for certain, but I think they will. Lewis Ferguson may not be back there next year, so you might not get to keep that project together. And if Juventus, and this is all if, it's all hypothetical, are turning around to him and saying, we're going to bring these next-gen players back in for you, and do you know what? We could probably... Uh, scrape up 50 60 million euros to go and get some players that, that are worth you having in the in the in the transfer window maybe even more um then that is going to be an attractive proposition to him i think i uh okay i mean i don't actually believe any of this stuff not <laughs> at least from what i understand about tiago monta and these conversations mm-hmm. i agree with you entirely everything that i've been told has told me that he actually wants to stay for another year for bologna because mm-hmm. he feels he started this project so I'm not understanding where all these headlines are coming from because I feel like that's been well established in the journalistic community that he that he you know is not somebody who's yet sure and is leaning towards staying at Bologna. So I'm not entirely sure how all these conversations have taken place already. And when you know you've just had Juventus management come out like a few weeks ago and talk about Allegri being here for the long term, I think it's normal to think of possible replacements. I think Zidane is one that they will definitely look to bring in. The, the question with Zidane is, is what he has with his family. So he has a, from what I understand, is that he has a deal with his wife um, about the fact that she followed him around as a player, but as a coach, she calls the shots. So she's like, there are sp- specific places that I don't, you know, I want to live in Spain. I and This is my home now. And that was a reason why he's stuck around with Real Madrid and didn't want to go to Manchester United, all these other things. It's about whether or not she would be okay with living in Turin. So I think that's the deal that they have to make, whether or not he wants to come. But he personally, apparently, has always loved the idea, according to his closest friends. Would he be an option? For sure. But again, it doesn't fall in line with what it is that Juventus are trying to build. Now, moving on to Thiago Monte, the way that you judge a coach really is that once your team you can always be an underdog for a season, a little bit like, you know, your style of play is difficult to play against, but it's maintaining that for a second season that I think actually is one of the hardest things that you can do. So I'd love to see Thiago Mota for another season to really be able to see what but he can do. This kind of is his second season. Mm. Like You're last right. season, he had a bad start, but then after his first five games, I think if you sort of eliminate the first five games, they had uh, something like the joint fifth best results in the league after that sort of betting in period. Um, yeah, which and is he a lost bit some arbitrary. Important I'm players. my numbers, but but still, there there was improvement last season. I think you can say that. Yeah, and he lost some big players, but it's mm. it's different ob- objectives, right? Because you're still sort of being treated as the, as the team that no one really thinks is going to be a huge opponent, right? But then. Mm-hmm. But once you're going in the Champions League, people are now thinking of you as being Bologna that could intimidate them. And so I wonder if that changes the mentality of opposition. Either way, though, another thing that you always question with coaches who take on big jobs, whether it be Inter Milan or Juve, is can they handle egos? But he, we don't need to worry about that because Juventus doesn't have any. <laughs> it doesn't have any. Well, I think they've got any two big, big egos anymore. up front, haven't they, to be honest, who probably Chiesa. think they're better Chiesa's than they gone. actually are. But really, it's are just Keza. Well. I think Vlahovic exactly. as well has a bit of a strut to him that I don't necessarily like, that he doesn't back up with the numbers, if you ask me. But, um... <laughs> 
Yeah. Oh, Patrick, there's a part of me here that really wants to hug you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, because I do feel like the Juventus uh, fan fandoms or the player, people out there really, really do think that these two are like the, the next coming of Ronaldo and, and Tevez or, you know, the Juventus stalwarts. But it's it, what based on what statistics are you looking at or style of play, do you guys really think that you can judge these players to be anywhere near the likes of Karim Benzema or, or any of these true legends of the game anyway? But he has to deal with these two potential egos, but there isn't... My point is, is if he is off put by Keza, I think people will, if, if Tiago Mota and Keza don't work, I think people will start actually asking questions of Keza a lot more than they are asking now. Because now it's a little bit like, what's going on now, you know? And, you know, Allegri had these issues or that, you know, the national team isn't always picking Keza, Mancini didn't always pick Keza, you know, maybe there is something actually wrong. <laughs> so rather than right now, we can just blame Allegri for every single player making a mistake. And so this is where I'm interested to see. Although, did anyone see Rabiot for France? I mean, the hideousness, the actual hideousness that he's actually like 10 times better for Juventus, you know, like, and, and that's saying something. So anyway. Right, we need to move on I, because I, I'm I, conscious that I'm we've really, been really talking. Question. I'm mm. on a really quick question, just a really quick one. Because I kind of missed you on the other side of this. Do you guys see a big future for Max Allegri? after Juventus because I'm not sure where else he goes after this I think when he left last time his stock was high and I expected him to get a, a job at, in another country at a big club and I'm not sure if he looks as good as he did um, before he came back I think he could go to the no, Middle Napoli East Napoli will still want him no I, Napoli would take him no, if he's I don't think so. Inter would take him if Inzaghi goes of course they would no, of course I don't they see would. Inter, I don't would see not take taking him I don't see Inter take him as for Napoli they've got so many appointments wrong I, I don't think they're immune to everything that is being written and being said about him. But I, I just want, before we move on, I wanted to make one final point about Thiago Motta. And, the, and Real Madrid. The issue, for, the issue for Bologna, I think, is that if you qualify for the Champions League, that's actually when you need to strengthen the team. And they've got some of their players that yeah. he's really improved, Ferguson and Zierkse, amongst others. Mm. If they were to be then sold on, and, and Zierkse, there's mm. that 50% sell-on clause that, that Bayern have, um, and F Ferguson, there's a lot of interest in, in him from Juventus, amongst others, then you're struggling because not only do you need to manage three games a week, you need to try and manage that European campaign, but you also need to stay competitive domestically. And, and I could see almost Bologna doing a little bit what Leicester did after they won the Premier League, whereby you just, I think Leicester made the quarterfinals of the Champions League in that season. I think Bologna think, OK, we're going to enjoy our European campaign and we're going to accept for a season that we might even finish in the bottom half. We're not going to go down, but it's unlikely we'd, we'd qualify for Europe again. But Bologna, 3-0 winners against Selenitano. We forgot to uh, preface our chat about yeah. them with, uh, with their <laughs> victory. And if you haven't seen the goals, they're wonderful. The first two in particular, Orsolini bringing down a 60-yard breaking ball from California. We haven't talked about that Lazio. Into the top I know. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then a lovely goal from Salamakas. Yeah, let's talk about Lazio because Igor Tudor, mm -hmm. unlike Allegri, had five days to work with, uh, with his team pretty much in terms of training sessions, appointed during the international break after Marto Cielo had been caretaker for Lazio and their winner at Frosinone. And he has some very bold ideas about football. You know, he's just similar to, to Gasparini and Juric and that he likes this sort of man against man all over the pitch, albeit it, it's quite different to them. He didn't go with the system everyone was expecting, which was the 3-4-2-1. It was more of a 4-4-2. And what I was impressed about was how he spoke before the game and how his players seemed to be very receptive of that, Nicky. He said before the game, um, I want my players to be bold, to be brave, to try and implement the new ideas that we're bringing through, even if that means they don't come off I'll take the fall for that, but I want to see them trying to do it. And I think Lazio did try and do it. They created a lot, a lot of chances. Yeah, and, and I think there are some, it, it's really sort of dangerous to make sweeping conclusions after one game, but there's things that you saw. You saw them pressing high up the pitch. You saw them making challenges. You saw that sort of desire to, to like you say, to set the tempo and, and to be aggressive. And I think those are the things that, that you sort of get immediate clues about what sort of team um, you're, you're trying to be. Um, Again, I, I, I sort of, um, I, I think there's just so much in this team that needs to be stripped out and rethought about. There's just not many players in this team individually who I'm particularly impressed by. Um, started this game obviously with Castellanos up front. Is that with a certain amount of? Well, we know Immobile is hitting a certain age. We also know he might not be here next season. Is that the choice they're going to make? Um, but I just. There's so much in this squad that doesn't impress me. And it, it's always a bit of a sort of red flag for me when 
I'm watching Lancey on thinking, oh, Philippe Anderson was good. Not because Philippe Anderson is bad. He's, he's a solid player. But I think he's he's really not a star, Philippe Anderson. And and I think that if that's the player who's catching my you eye, think most, he it's is. Not, not boding the well for the, for the rest of the team. Um, but I, I think you've got, yeah, as you said, Patrick, there's intent in it. There's intent in it and it seems like the players bought in. And I think for game one, that's all you can ask for as, as a new manager. Actually, Patrick, can I ask you a question? What what do you think of the comments that he made, Igor Tudor? Like, does anyone else, like, I, I need to preface this by saying I absolutely adore this man. I would have loved this man to have taken over after being I mean, I'm, I love Igor Tudor. But there was mm. something about some of his speeches about starting from scratch. I didn't, I didn't know if there was enough respect for Sadi's work, if that makes sense. I, compl- I, I completely I feel like agree a lot of it- with you. I think there were quite a few sort of, okay. yeah, I think there were a little, some snidey remarks there, you know, saying right? the players have been working under a system for two and a half years. You know, these ideas are pretty revolutionary to them. It's just like, well, if you actually look at your respective careers in trophy cabinets, Sadi's achieved a lot more. I, I think yeah, that left a Thank little you. bit of a bad taste, to be honest. So yeah, bad taste. I, I, I read good. those comments the same way as you. They were second last year. That needs reminding mm. all the time. Lazio was second last year. It's not. They were not um, struggling for most of Sarri's time in charge. He just ended on a sour note. Also, like they've played some really great matches. Like as an even mm. even like even in the Champions League against Bayern, it was almost like he, the way he talked about it was not. It's a, a, as if Sadi was to blame for everything going on in Lazio, and rather than carrying on the fact that there are some problems. Anyway, it just it just sort of came across to me as I didn't enjoy reading those comments. I was a little bit disappointed. By Agreed. Them. I, I read a very interesting. Obviously, we've got the we've got the Rome derby coming up Saturday night at six o'clock, which is going to be fantastic because until a few short weeks ago, we thought it was going to be the latest goalless draw between Mourinho against Sarri, and and now I, I read a very interesting piece <laughs> in um, in Il Messaggero about about Roma and Lazio and about how so much of what they do is actually linked to one another, whereby Lazio initially appointed Maurizio Sarri almost in response to the fact that Mourinho had made this big splash with Roma and that appointment had come out of nowhere, etc. It feels a little bit now like, albeit Sarri did them a favour by resigning, but the two-door appointment is slightly younger, a bit fresher in the style of uh, of Daniele De Rossi. And, and they also reference the fact that Batistuta was signed way back when, at the you know, in the new millennium, because Lazio had won the league and it was Roma's response to Lazio winning the league and, and then Roma obviously went on to win the Scudetto the year afterwards. I, I think it's, we're still a long way from having a um, a title winner from the capital. I think we had that, that question from from one of our, <laughs> our listeners. But let's talk about Roma and, and have one eye as well on the Derby della Capitale coming up. A goalless draw against Lecce, but a goalless draw, Mina, which I think flattered Roma, all things considered. Oh, absolutely. I, I definitely agree with that. But actually, before before this uh, podcast started, we were having a quick chit chat about some of the games. And Patrick, you said that you were actually quite impressed that it was only a draw. Um, Patrick has since disappeared. <laughs> this is bringing me trauma of how men react to me. I'm joking. <laughs> Anyway, um, my bad. but you said something along the lines of you actually thought that this could be a potential loss. And so I, I need you to tell me why, because I've been waiting until this point in the pod to ask why, why were you not sure about Roma's performance in this particular match? Several factors. One, I'm a, I'm a, I like to try and anticipate sort of quirky numbers. And I, I did the commentary last night and I noticed that Lecce had only ever beaten Roma twice and both wins for Lecce had come in the month of April. And yesterday was not only... April the 1st, it was obviously April Fool's Day. So I had a bit of a hunch with that and it nearly came off had Lecce actually scored some of their chances, but Patrick Dorgu and Roberto Piccoli and Nikola Kristovic all pretty profligate. Uh, and the other reason why was I just looked at the Roma team and I felt pretty uninspired. Pellegrini was suspended. Dybala wasn't fit enough to start. It, it just felt like they were a bit short and, and so it proved. It's, it's a strange one. You often hear coaches debating with the media about how their team are going to respond after an international break, particularly with the bigger teams, because so many players go away on international duty. And Roma just felt very flat. Um, and it's the first of five games mm-hmm. in 18 days, six in 22. They've got that double header coming up against Milan, which is seven days apart. And in between, they've got the derby. They've got a trip to Udinese. It's going to be a pretty pivotal period. And um, yeah, Lecce only the third team to have taken points off De Rossi's Roma in the league. So, you know, the other two were Fiorentina and, uh, and Inter. Um, but yeah, I, it didn't feel like Roma could win the game. They had a big chance with Awad in the second half off the bench. But I think it had Lecce, Lecce haven't scored now um, from one of their own players in 60 days. So their last two goals have come from own goals. And I think that's the only thing that spared Roma a defeat there because they weren't good. 
And, and Lecce is, is, is a very difficult atmosphere as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I was thinking before about watching a lot of football without goals, and this is obviously another 90 minutes without goals, in, <laughs> but a very different 90 mm. minutes. And, but a really and fun I, game, yeah. yeah. Um, and Lecce are, this is, it's not new, actually. I think they have um, the second worst difference between um, expected goals and goals scored of any team in Serie A this season. They're, they're very good at not putting the ball in the net when they should. And mm. if they scored as often as they should, then they probably would not be really in the relegation fight. Um, and and some of that comes down to the realities of being a, a club of, of more modest means. They just don't have those um, really efficient finishes. There's some really fun players there like, like um, uh, Ramadani, like Almquist, there's players who's doing good things, but who aren't necessarily um, as, as efficient as they could be. And certainly up front, they're lacking that really sort of killer striker. Um, they should have won this game. Roma dodged a bullet. And I think uh, you can look at that one of two ways. You can either say it's the um, the thing that good teams do, getting a result when they shouldn't. Or you can say maybe Roma, who we think probably have overperformed a bit under Didossi. I think he's he's definitely brought some good things, but I think they've also probably been on the other side of that XG consideration where they've got results when they haven't always deserved to. Um, maybe they're going to get a little bit of swing back at some point, and this was part of it. Indy can now suspended I... for the derby. That's probably a, a, a benefit given how badly he played in, in the first half. And I think, Mina, we saw that Baldanzi is not ready really to start for Roma as well. He was pretty underwhelming. No, Paul Karlsdorp is really alone in, in trying to, to cover um, and to to defend. That whole left side of uh, Lecce actually looks like a mini Milan with Theo and Leo, but just not with the talent of No, no, Theo that was the Leo. first time they played but, the two together. I was really impressed with Gallo and Dorgu. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was a really, it was, they were really fun to watch. You look at Piccoli, you look at Kristovic, and there's a lot of talent there. It's amazing how many, it's almost like they were like, the odds had, favoured them to I don't know how to explain it all came together and they can't score a goal it was always bizarre I feel like this happens a lot recently with Italian teams um, especially in the Champions League but anyway um, I think that I personally thought that this would be a really easy win for him so I was quite surprised by everything and the way that things were going also because this is Luca Gotti's second game right it was a it was a you know they won one nil against Salernitana but with an own goal <laughs> Yeah, and exactly. So I didn't expect them to. I mean, they are playing at home, but I just didn't expect them against this Roma side that's full of confidence. Also because Lukaku for Belgium had managed this amazing like three valor assist, and I was thinking, wow, like where did that come from? And I and I thought there would be a lot of confidence on the back of that, but we didn't see like the best Lukaku. Obviously, there is an absence of of creativity in Pellegrini and Pellegrini and Dybala not being able to play more than a couple of minutes. So that was always going to be a massive problem. Um, and so I, I still thought that the, based on energy and intensity, potentially Roma can do something. They do. But Paredes looked overwhelmed in midfield as well. It was very strange to watch that, in all honesty. But yeah, I think Lecce should have scored a goal. I'm amazed at how they couldn't. I mean, their XG is 1.89 in this game. So that's incredible. And yet you couldn't get it. Like, it, that must be so disappointing um, for them. Uh, but at least, you know, they main, they maintained the high pressure that we saw under Diversa. They, they, they've, they've got a great attitude going forward. And if I see this from them every game, I hope they stay up. Just because I, I, I brought up those numbers I was mentioning about the XG, because you said it in this game, Mina, like this is going off Opta's numbers. But the difference between um, Lecce's expected goals and the number of goals they scored is, according to Opta, minus 12.28. Wow. So they're 12 and a half goals short of where they should be. The only team worse than that is Empoli, and uh, and the next team above them actually is is Napoli on on nine point two one. So it's a big gap between those bottom two and everyone else. They really are um, not scoring at the rate you'd expect them to. We'll get to Napoli. It's just crossed my mind, and hopefully mm. Simon can work his magic in post production. That I didn't start the episode by saying all about our reminder for our free seven day trials of our Chronicles Two Thousand <laughs> Patreon membership, so you can get access to all full episodes one hundred percent ad free plus bonuses such as videos and behind-the-scenes content. Do subscribe to the Serie A Chronicles YouTube channel. Delighted to say I've since crossed, up, crossed over the, uh, the four-figure threshold as well. 1,009 <laughs> as of counting. Uh, and uh, please give us a five-star rating. Yeah, that's especially important. And a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening to help us to be found. Um, quickly, because I know I'm always conscious of time, ahead of the Rome derby, in previous editions, Lazio were getting the edge over Roma. Sarri seemed to uh, have, again, yeah, just the edge over Mourinho. And we had the spate of sort of tight games or 1-0 wins. 
prior to Tudor's appointment, I would have said Roma would have started as favourites given how well they've been playing under De Rossi. Do you still have the Giallo Rossi as favourites? They will be the home team in the derby. And I know a lot of people think that doesn't ma- matter for anything because they share a stadium. I think it does count for a lot because it's reflected also in the, in the ticket allocation as well. Serial Chronicles is a Media Chronicles production.